Coming up on Pet Heroes. A dog saves a man's life after a deadly construction accident. And a forest ranger's horse is his only chance for survival after a horrific bear attack. Hi, I'm Jason McCoy, and welcome to Pet Heroes. Can animals sense when their masters are in danger, or are they just acting on instinct? Well, today we examine two stories of people who are isolated in the woods with incredible injuries who are taken to safety by their pet heroes. Our first story takes place in Whistler, BC, where Dennis Breen is fulfilling a lifelong dream of building his own home. Whistler was a, a lot different 30 years ago. You could almost call it, I guess, a little bit of a hippie culture. Everybody had a dog. You just had a dog. It was 1979 when I got him. A bilk, U-B-I-L-K, means whale in Inuit. When he was mature, he would have gone about 120 pounds. Half Malamute, half Golden Retriever. Like a big, huge Golden Retriever with long hair and a Malamute head. He was very calm around people, but there was a lot of wildness in him. I cannot count the number of times, the number of tomato baths he had, because he loved to kill skunks, and he loved to kill porcupines. He would chase off any animals that came close to the property. A lot of the times you'd see him sit up and become alert and take off into the bush. Malamutes, although they can bark, they choose not to. Sometimes at night he would howl, but uh, barking, no. Beautiful dog, beautiful dog, yeah. By the early 80s, Dennis has a wife, Valerie, and is fulfilling an old dream. My grandfather told me repeatedly when I was growing up that you, you won't be a man until you build your own house. So I thought, I'll take it to the next level and I won't just build it, I'll cut the trees down, peel them, you know, do, it, do it old school. He buys a remote acreage on Brew Mountain, south of Whistler. And while living in the property's existing dwelling, sets to work constructing a log home from scratch. When you get off the highway and come to the end of the gravel road here and walk up, you, you might as well be a million miles from anywhere. In the original cabin, there was 88 logs that I drug in. And I'd say that that took about four months just to get them here on site. It took a long time. Valerie works in Vancouver for three weeks every month. She's able to take one of the trains that constantly run through their property. Logging was very active in the area and the mills north of here. There was probably uh, eight to 10 trains a day that would go by. And when Valerie was at work for those 17 day stints, it was just me and Abel, Abel and I. Abel at this time was a year and a half old. A lot of times I'd go fishing. You could catch eight to 10 pan fryers on demand. It was like a grocery store, only you had to throw a line in. I'd go down and catch a couple of fish, cook them for breakfast, I'd heat eat them raw, We'd just boom, head, tail, the works. But he did prefer if you prepared, prepared them for <laughs> with a little salt. When not hard at work, Dennis and Ubbolt often visit the only other people in the area, the Stockdales. The Stockdales were extremely colorful people. Um, Ken had immigrated from Scotland. He was short, short and stocky, enormous hands. Edna, Edna was an excellent cook. And Edna would always have treats for Abel. They were very welcoming. They were very interested in what I was doing and a little skeptical that I'd ever pull it off, as everyone was. So this is where Abel and I would come very frequently to visit the Stockdale, sometimes for coffee or tea in the morning. To get to the Stockdales, Dennis and Ubbolt have to navigate a kilometer of treacherous mountain trail. The train da down to the tracks at that time was very rough. I just had a path. Once you hit the tracks, you had to walk along the tracks to a gravel road. Once you hit the gravel road, no, it was fine. By August of 1983, the cabin is almost complete. Years of intensive labor are paying off beautifully. The roof was on. Um, I was into the finishing. 
process of construction. I was very close to getting ready to stain the logs. Before staining, Dennis wants to strip the cambium from the logs. It's the layer between the bark and the wood which, if left on, turns dark. So I wanted to remove most of the cambium before I finished it so that the logs had a, a nice golden look to them. To accomplish this, he uses a grinder. Welders use them, car mechanics use them. The only difference would be in grinding logs. You have to take off the safety guard and the handle because the logs are concave, and you can't get in where the logs join. So you're holding on to the head of the housing and the handle. And it's quite easy to, for it to kick out of your hand if it jams. It's a dangerous way to use a grinder. And I wore a catcher's backstop because it had kicked many times and hit me in the chest. So the RPM on this is 10,000 RPMs per minute. Divide 60 into 10,000, what do you get? 12, uh, I don't know, a lot. <laughs> 10,000 per minute. <laughs> Woohoo! Then, on what began as just another working day, Dennis turned his grinder to a problematic corner. And there was a vertical log in the kitchen, which meets a horizontal log. And I was standing on a step ladder and doing what you should never do. I had my face at the same level as the grinder. You should always have the grinder lower than your head. Well, this is the scene of the crime. I'm uh, on the bottom rung of a, of a six-foot ladder, vertical log, horizontal log. You can see where I never finish grinding. I got a full face shield on and great big glass lens glasses. I stupidly go in too far, just for a split second. It jams just faster than you know, the blink of an eye. Boom! Face shield splits in half and glass entered right above my eye. The edge of it apparently had nicked my optic nerve and was touching my brain. Didn't know this at the time. I fell off the ladder and was unconscious for how long, I have no idea. Dennis Breen is badly injured. If he doesn't get help, he'll die. After the break, can Dennis's dog, Hubble, possibly find a way to save his master? Stay tuned. Dennis Breen has just suffered a horrible accident as a grinder slams into his face at full force. His dog, Ubble, hears the noise and runs inside. I felt Ubble licking my face. He was licking the blood off my face and it brought me to consciousness. Wendy McClellan, a doctor of veterinary medicine, offers her unique perspective on animal behavior two main things would, would trigger Ubbolt into action. He could smell the blood, I mean, the senses were going crazy, and he could see the, the change in behavior. I mean, it was not normal for Dennis to be lying on the ground motionless, and this stimulated Ubbolt to take action. Ubbolt's first reaction was to lick his face. When dogs have puppies, the first thing that mother does, even b before anything else, is, is to lick that baby thoroughly. They're almost rough with it, but they're stimulating that baby to take its first breath. So he was doing that to Dennis to, to elicit a response to see if he would wake up normally. I remember trying to get my breath back. I felt like I'd been hit by a truck and incredible pain in, in my head, which was the glass. I didn't realize it was in there, right? I had a pressure bandage in my toolkit. I just thought I've been cut badly, so I gotta get a pressure bandage on this. But I put the pressure bandage on and as, as I tried to apply pressure, the pain would increase, so I couldn't get it on very good. So I couldn't stop the bleeding. I got it on as tight as I could, as tight as I could stand. And then I knew I had to get out of there, and the, the first help would be the Stockdales. I knew they'd be home, they always were. With his master in severe trauma, Abilk knows what he has to do. Took up by the collar, I said to him, Stockdales. And he just started down the path. The path to the Stockdales is very familiar to Ubbolt. Ubbolt and Dennis travel it almost daily. So when he senses that his master is in trouble from the drastic change in Dennis's behavior, he heads straight there. Ubbolt was a Malamute retriever cross, and certainly retrievers are known for their loyalty. And the Malamute part, they're tough. 
they are meant to be in the wilderness, in the cold. So I think the combination of loyalty and toughness just showed in Oval's character. So the path turns right here and it gets considerably steeper and the problem with crawling on your hands and knees on a steep path and losing consciousness is gravity adds insult to injury. Every time I passed out, and I, I passed out right here, you would lurch forward and do a total face dive into the rocks and, and, and wood. It was no fun. But Elba stuck with me. But I regained consciousness and proceeded down this hill. Uh, it's a good thing it wasn't as gnarly as it is now. I never would have made it. But uh, just a slow crawl. Hubble's leading the way. I'm holding his tail. And of course, when I pass out, I'd let go of his tail. But every time I regain conscious, he was just sitting there beside me, uh, waiting. And I'd grab his tail and I'd say, Stockdale's. And off he'd go. He already knew, though. He knew, he knew exactly what was going on. So this is where I exited. This is grown in. There used to actually be a path here 27 years, right? Things change. I wasn't walking. I was crawling, holding on to Hubble's tail. I crawled down the side of the hill, crawled down the path, crawled through the ditch, up onto the tracks. When I got to the tracks, I lost consciousness. As I passed out, I remember thinking, sure, hope a train doesn't come along right now. So at the point where, where Dennis did not regain consciousness, Hubble's attempts would have been several. And once he realized that he's not getting a response, it was time to, to, go, to go get help and again elicit that pack mentality of, of running and finding help. When he went to the Stockdales, they at first thought it was just one of his regular visits, but he did something very unusual for him was he went up onto the porch, uninvited, walks over, puts his paw on Ken's knee and barks. And Ken immediately thought something's up here. That still didn't spark him into action. Abul turned around, sat down, and began to bark nonstop. It started to hurt his throat. He was barking so loud. I think that's why Malamutes choose not to bark. It hurts them. At that point, Ken realized something's wrong. Abul's instincts when he ran to the Stocktails to get help, he knew that it was safe. He was eliciting a response of, of I know that they'll come back. Uh, and that behavior, that rally the pack behavior is, is deeply ingrained. They learn it as puppies. They learn that when that bark, that shrill bark happens, they know to pay attention and quit their little puppy games and to follow. And he looked down about 150 yards and saw me passed out across the tracks. Somehow he did a fireman's carry. Got, got me over his shoulder. Ken manages to carry Dennis from the tracks to his car and rushes him to the hospital in nearby Squamish. But his injuries are too severe. So he's taken by ambulance to Vancouver General Hospital, where doctors are able to save him. So this is the chunk of glass that they took out of my head. Never bothered washing the blood off. And apparently it went in this way. Um, and it was completely buried it was pressing on the top of my eyeball, nicked my optic nerve, and apparently the doctor said if this part, of, this part was pressing on my brain, he said I came very close to performing um, a homemade frontal lobotomy. <laughs> the, the impact of the um, grinder had shattered the eyebrow, so they fashioned a, an, an eyebrow out of Teflon and, and somehow se secured it to my skull. I felt very lucky and very thankful to that dog, to Hubble, because I definitely would not, I would not have gotten out of here without him, no question. I've got some extra nice, nice meals for, for quite a while. <laughs> the story of Dennis and Hubble really is classic to the human-animal bond. The lengths Hubble went to to find help in this difficult, isolated terrain were nothing short of remarkable. He lived to be 12 years old. That's 84 in our years. Just died one night. And uh, there's a pet cemetery about 100 yards from here where he's buried, and a little, little monument. 
I'll learn that monument for sure. I moved a large rock on top of where I buried him and uh, planted a rose bush. It's a big part of my life. Absolutely, a spirit's part of this place. I'm reminded of Abu every time I look at that log in my kitchen. I'm reminded of him constantly. I think about him a lot. Next, after a vicious bear attack, a bleeding and barely conscious forest ranger must rely upon his horse to lead him to safety. We just saw how dogs see their masters as the alpha and will do whatever is necessary to come to their aid. But is this true of all animals? Well, let's examine the story of forest ranger Ronnie Lyle and his horse Dusty. Don Fragrant, now in his 70s, remembers back to 1952. He had just turned 16 and was spending his summer at the remote Meadows Ranger Station in central Alberta. Ed was the assistant ranger and uh, Ronnie was one of the head rangers. During the summer, the main function with the horses out there was to patrol the trails. They had about 100 miles of, of pack trail, as they called it. Well, it began uh, in the morning, probably about 9 o'clock, uh, on a lousy, rainy, drizzly day. Uh, Ed and I just worked around the station there, fixing saddles, and Ronnie was going out to bring the horses in because we had to get ready for the trail work that summer. The horses were out just grazing outside the fence, and they usually didn't go too far, a couple of miles or so, and we pretty much knew where they'd be. Dusty, one of the more difficult horses to catch, has a bell fastened around his neck to assist the rangers in finding him. Ronnie came to this meadow, and he was starting across the meadow, and we <laughs> heard this noise and looked. Then all of a sudden, here's a bear coming at him. At his, at his boots. It finally hooked him so sturdily that uh, it dislodged him from the tree, and he dropped, and he landed right flat on his back, and it knocked him unconscious. The bear uh, had dragged uh, Ronnie away from the tree over to the edge of the clearing. What he intended to do later, who knows? Ronnie Lyle lies battered, bruised, and near death when Dusty arrives. <laughs> Dusty had wandered over near to him, and that was a bit unusual. He, he was not overly friendly, as I recall. It was a little bit surprising that he's the one to step up and, and uh, come into action. Horses do not like the smell of bears. If you're riding a horse and it smells a bear, it will halt in its tracks, it will snort, it will try and do everything to, to turn around. So for Dusty to come and stand there with the smell of bear all around was, was really unique. He allowed Ronnie to, to pull on his mane, stand up. In times of stress and when something is out of the ordinary, horses want to go home. They know the way home and they know home is safe. We were getting a little anxious when finally he appeared coming across the, uh, the meadow. Ronnie needs emergency medical attention. One of the rangers takes a tractor to fetch the nearest doctor, but on the way back, it gets stuck in deep mud. It was, I, I think, roughly about one or two in the morning. Suddenly the door opened on the cabin and 
And in came Don McDonald. He said, uh, have you got a horse here? I said, yeah, Dusty's here. He's in the barn. Dusty is called into action again as Don Fragrant rides him to where the stranded doctor awaits. Only had to go about a mile, and I could hear them with their voices. They were just starting to come up the last hill there. And uh, as soon as we put the doctor up on that horse, he brightened right up. Ronnie did quite well. Uh, he recovered probably uh, in the matter of about uh, two or three months. The rangers learned that the only reason that the bear didn't take Ronnie's life was that he already had a fresh kill to tend to. But if Dusty hadn't shown up, the bear certainly would have returned to finish him off. I guess it's one of those little, little miracles to do with animals, that uh, it's the one that you might least expect to do it, but it seemed to sense what, uh, what was going on and that, and that Ronnie needed help. Uh, I have no other explanation. Dusty. He uh, saved the day, I guess you could say, really. There are differences in the way dogs and horses bond. Both can bond, but horses don't bond in the same way. That intelligence level isn't there, and certainly the devotion that dogs feel to people isn't there. But they still bond. They still will follow you around the field. They still exhibit affection. They still like it when, when you give them affection. It's just in a different way. Can animals sense when their masters are in trouble, or are they just going on instinct? Dennis Breen and Ronnie Lyle were both saved by the rapport they built with their animals. Ubble, operating from the pack mentality of assisting the alpha, and Dusty recognizing the disruption in his usual pattern. Despite the differences, their stories are proof that when catastrophe strikes, the bond between an animal and their human companion can mean the difference between life 